Alan wanted to ask if you could talk for a second about how united or disunited these different bands of uh, American Indians were during this period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really important question. Um, the, the Indian sort of political system was kind of like uh, a set of like Russian dolls that built up one over the other, you know, like one inside the other. So one's first allegiance was always to your local band. Your local band was um, your father and his brothers. And it might have been a group of about 60 people. Those size units were then united uh, under uh, more regional kinds of chiefs. And um, then they made up what we call divisions. Sometimes they're called bands or tribes. The nomenclature is uh, kind of confusing, but what we like to call divisions. These were these major groups that had kind of their own territories. So again, the Penatoka or um, honey eaters in central Texas, the Kotzadekas or buffalo eaters up on the high plains, the Yamporekas, root eaters on the high plains, the Quahatis in the west, and there were some others. And um, in all cases, you, your, your closest allegiance was, was always to the local people. But at certain times when there were threats, either from other tribes or from the army, that encouraged people to get together and take direction from overarching leaders. So Kwana, for certain moments in the history of this, he becomes a very important leader. If you talk to Comanche people today, they go, well, you know, Kwana wasn't the only chief and, you know, not everybody followed Kwana, but at certain moments he was, you know, he was, he galvanized people and got them going in attacks. And we see with Ishitai is the same kind of thing. He's, his appeal is he's a medicine man and he mobilizes some 700 Comanches, Kiowas and Cheyennes to go on a, on an attack. But as soon as that attack starts to fail, he has no authority anymore. And so it was a very fluid kind of um, system where people made assessments, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis about how things were working out and who they needed to align with. And sometimes they were all fragmented and easily divided, and other times they would get together and be a strong force. Interesting. Um, building on that and some of the the uh, military planning from the U.S. Army side of things. Uh, CJ wanted to ask um, about the influence of William Tecumseh Sherman's response to learning he had narrowly missed uh, being part of the Salt Creek Massacre. Um, yeah. And if that influenced yeah. sort of the larger yeah. approach of the U.S. Army in any meaningful way in some of these, uh, these efforts. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's generally accepted, and, and um, uh, the gentleman refers to an episode that we didn't mention, but uh, Sherman, after the Civil War, does a uh, kind of a tour of the frontier, and um, he's uh, in an, what they called an ambulance, which was a kind of wagon, you know, kind of touring through a region, and he doesn't realize it, but um, he passes right under uh, a large Kiowa war party that's watching his retinue go by on this trail um, from, uh, from some hills nearby, and they decide to let that wagon pass. And then later, uh, the next wagon that comes along, there's a terrible massacre. Um, uh, they come down out of the hills and attack that wagon, and Sherman realizes that, you know, it, it, it was his lucky day because that could have been him. And so, these guys were all, you know, they were trained to be professional, but it's hard. It, it's it it it's it's hard to deny that there was there were certain personal um, experiences that they had that really motivated them. Sherman was uh, was the strongest sort of personality in forming this strategy. He's the one that came up with the uh, column approach, and. Uh, we know about his, uh, um, you know, his uh, strength of uh, conviction in the in the uh, at the closing of the Civil War. You know, he's famous for his march through Georgia. So he's kind of a no nonsense guy, 
and that's part of his personality. And then when he has this close call, I think it really triggers a personal uh, yeah. response in him. Yeah, everything it's everything becomes very personal when it was almost you <laughs> in that circumstance. Well, and and you know, Mackenzie, we we can't get we, we didn't have time to really go into Mackenzie, but I mean, he is he is and such he's such a um, a resolute and professional guy, but he's wounded like six times. He's always at the front of the line. Um, and um, these scars must have really, you know, mental scars must have cut him deeply because, you know, he actually, he went insane in his last years. Uh, uh, he, he just had what we recognize now as a really severe case of, uh, of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm -hmm. And um, he spent his final years uh, insane. Uh, in total contrast to the kind of uh, um, discipline and devotion that that he exhibited, uh, yeah. and, and and he's credited more than anyone. That, you know, it's been said Mackenzie did in five years what the Spanish couldn't do in 150 years, in terms of <laughs> subjugating the Plains Indian. Yeah. So right, uh, fascinating. Uh, well, I want to save time to make sure you can go through your documents. So I'd say let's go ahead and dive into those.